50,000 subscribers. Woohoo! The new Mac update is pretty cool. Wait for it. Ah, there you go. Balloons and stuff. I wanna talk a little bit about what happened over the past few months because the YouTube growth has been crazy. And I wanna to get to all of your questions, almost all of your questions that you asked in the community post. So let's get right down to it. I've been on YouTube for more than eight years now. And in the first eight years, I got 20,000 subscribers roughly. And now when I'm looking at other YouTubers videos sharing their metrics, I would love to know. I'm always dying to know about how much they earned. And so I think it's a nice thing to share. So let me just share that with you as well very quickly. This is how much I earned in the first eight years. It's nothing, eight years, remember? So I thought this channel is not gonna go anywhere. I don't think I'll ever do anything with this channel. So I was actually about to give up. And then something happened. And so this is, for the, this is the first eight years, right? 20,000 subscribers in the first eight years. Let's look at what happened in the last three months. This is last three months. I gained 30,000 subscribers and that led to the 50,000 that we are celebrating today. And of course, as a result of that, I got more money as well. But what the hell happened? What made my channel go from here to here? Look at that growth. Like what really happened? It was all because of this one video, I think. Um, this video on, I, I made a video on why moving charges create magnetism. I think it's a pretty, pretty widely asked question. I was very curious about that particular question. Usually it's not answered. So I made a video explaining, like, you know, giving a perspective using Einstein's theory of relativity. And like most of my videos on the channel, it was doing pretty normal. It was doing a few thousand views. But unlike most of the videos on my channel, it didn't stop. It just kept growing, growing, growing steadily. And so for the first 10 months, it kept growing steadily. Look at that. And it came up to 20,000. And then something happened in September. Something happened because of which it just skyrocketed, just like that. Like in a few days, it just went from like 20,000 to like 130,000, kept going, kept going. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, you know, I was actually on my vacation. I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, what is going on with this, with this video? I actually also posted in the community post um, asking what's going on. Then I looked at the comments and I came up with a hypothesis. There are two things that I thought worked. One is the subject itself. Relativity is a cool subject. So I thought that advanced physics like relativity, quantum, I love them, so probably other folks love them as well. The second thing is the conversational style. If you've seen my videos, you know that I pretend to talk to scientists. That's actually a very natural style for me. I used to do that a lot when I was teaching in classrooms. And so now today I wonder why didn't I do more of it earlier? But I was like, okay, if this is something that people like, and this is something I like to do, this is very natural to me. And I love the subject because I have so much to talk about relativity and quantum. I'm also learning as I'm making this video. So all of that is just working out. Why not just make a few more videos on the same subject and on the same in the same style and just see what happens. And turns out that it worked out. And that's, the, I think, is the reason why I'm seeing this crazy growth on the, ch on, on the channel. Um, thanks again for the 50,000 subscribers. And I think I'll continue doing that. The next video is equals MC squared. I'm super excited to share that because I think I, again, have a very intuitive um, understanding of what's going on over there. All right, now let's get down to the questions. Here are the first few set of questions. The reason why I've bunched them together is because I think collectively what they're asking is, you can pause and you can read them individually if you want to, but I think collectively what they're asking is like, how do you make physics intuitive and what inspires you to create these videos? So when it comes to making things intuitive, um, first of all, I think experience uh, counts a lot. I clearly, I can clearly see the difference between where I'm today versus where I was you know, about five years back. But I think like if I have to pinpoint a few things, well, the first one is I think the Feynman technique. When you try to teach something to people, I think that's one of the best ways to get a deeper understanding. But I think here's the key. The key is to try and teach something, whatever, whatever you think you wanna learn deeply, try to teach it to somebody, but use as simple words as possible and do not dumb it down. Like do not oversimplify it. Make sure that you try to convey all the nuances, all the subtleties, like, keep all the rigor as much as possible, but use as simple words as possible. I think that's the most challenging thing to do when you're trying to teach something to, or you're trying to you know, explain something to somebody else. But that's also the most enriching because when you try to do that, sometimes you will fail to articulate things very well. And that's when you'll realize, oh, you know what? Damn, I have gaps in my understanding. And so that I think is the first step, identifying the gaps, the logical gaps that you yourself have, the blind spots that you yourself might be having. And then once you identify those gaps, to try and understand them a little bit more deeper, ask questions like, why does it happen? Why not? What if questions? I think I do that a lot. 
To give you an example, I'm currently working on the whole equals mc squared derivation, and we'll get to that, of course, in the next video. But one point that I want to share is, I realized that the derivation involves looking at Doppler effect. Now, I did all the derivation and everything was cool, but then I realized, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Doppler effect is something that happens not just for light, it happens for everything, all waves. So if it's due to Doppler effect, then why don't we see it for sound waves? Why, why is it only in special theory of relativity? That question of why, you know, why not, for example, why not Doppler effect in sound also leads to sort of like equals mc squared for sound, for example. That question made me wonder a little bit more about what happens in Doppler effect on sound, made me compare it with the Doppler effect in light, and then I actually realized, oh my God, there's this, there's this subtle subtleties involved, there are some nuances involved, because of which it doesn't work out for, you know, sound waves and water waves and any other waves, it only works out for light waves. Again, I know it's not gonna make sense in this because it's out of context, but the point that I'm trying to tell you is that if you go in those tangents of why, why not explore all of this, it's gonna take more time, it's more fun, but it also, you know, gives you a deeper understanding and the deeper understanding you get, the more intuitive, I think, the subject becomes. Lastly, what about the equations? Um, I think of equations this way. Equations at the end of the day is basically trying to communicate in a more packaged way. That's what equations at the end of the day are. So if I look at an equation, if it doesn't make sense to me, well, there are two things that I can do. One is I try to look at where that equation came from. I look at the derivation and each step of the derivation, I try to look at, okay, does this make sense? And I try to imagine it like, you know, like, like, like what's, what's really going on? Why did this step, why did this step make sense? What does it mean step by step? And it takes time, oh my God. Sometimes it takes days. For example, right now I'm trying to understand Lorentz equation. Lorentz transforms in relativity. Um, trying to understand that and it takes days, but I think the more you think about it, the more you start gaining intuition behind it. And the second thing you can do is you can play around with that equation. And a concrete example for this one is, I was always confused, not confused, I was always, um, I always felt like this equation of centripetal acceleration, um, A is equal to V square over R. I always felt that was not very intuitive for me. Like I didn't understand why it was V square over R. Even though I looked at the derivation, I just didn't make sense to me. Um, then I thought about playing along with it a little bit. So like, you know, if A is equal to V squared over R, then if you double the velocity, acceleration becomes, centripetal acceleration becomes four times. But why does it happen? Like, what does it mean? Like, can I visualize that? I started going into that tangent, right? And then it actually worked out. I was actually able to put it all together. I was also able to, do, we also have internet. So I'm pretty sure like there's, there's stuff out there. So you don't have to figure everything out yourself. With all of that, I was actually able to make sense of how when the velocity vector becomes bigger and you know you go faster, the change in the velocity increases and how the acceleration actually changes. And I also made a video on that, not asking you to watch it or anything, but I'm just saying that this is the vicious cycle, right? You try to teach something to somebody and then you identify your gaps and then you dig into it. You ask the why questions, you ask the why not, what if questions and that gives you the intuition and then go back to try and explain it to uh, somebody. And then, uh, you know, again, you'll identify more gaps and this cycle, this vicious cycle, do that for 10 years. <laughs> and then you will have way more intuition than I ever had in any subject. Like, you know, you're gonna have that. Secondly, what inspires me uh, to create these videos? So whenever things click in my head, like I've been at it for such a long time and now finally it clicks, the joy that I get, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm telling you folks, I think I'm addicted to that high. I, I get the most high, like trust me, I don't get that high when I look at the number of views or subscribers. I get the most high when something clicks and I feel like, ah, oh, this makes so much sense. And what I want to do is just try and make somebody else experience that. I think that's why I got into teaching, right? Because when I saw that I could translate that and I could see that happen on somebody else's, it was like a collective high. I was like, right, right, do you see that as well? And the other person is, yes, I see that as well, that's amazing. And I feel like that's the ulterior motive that I have. Like, <laughs> I don't care about your exam marks. I'm sure you're gonna do well in your life and you're gonna find your passion and all of that, but my ulterior motive is just that. Uh, I spoke a lot about these questions, but there were a lot of questions and I think this is, this is an important question for me. Okay, moving on. The next couple of questions are, are on JEE. Now, if you don't know what JEE is, JEE stands for Joint Entrance Exam. It's an overhyped high school exam. Uh, why is it so hyped? Because it's an exam that gets you into Ivy League uh, engineering colleges in India, the Indian Institutes of Technology. 
And therefore people are all over it. There are like coaching industries that make millions and millions of money because of that. People are just like crazy. They just they slog, students slog for like two to three years and they just like go through it. Um, so the question is on like, what are some tips? What are some tricks? So, so no, sorry, what, what is the question exactly? Well, yeah, what are some tips um, to crack this exam for people who are interested in the subject, I think the question is that, you know, if you're interested in pure subject like physics and you love the joy and the wonder of it, this exam just destroys it. I hate this exam. Like, yeah, I think it's not, it's not a surprise because this exam at the end of the day is a puzzle, you know? So it's, it's, it's like a very, very hard puzzle. And so you'll have to do a lot of drill and practice and you have to manage your time and you have to strategize, you have to pick your subjects and you, you, you do all the exam stuff. And I think that kills the joy and the wonder and the beauty that physics or science in general has. And so the question is like, what do you do? How do you, how do you balance the two? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that because any answer I give you will not be, um, I will not be able to justify it because I don't really coach um, J for JE, but here's one thing that I can, here's one perspective that I can give you. And that is, you know, at the end of the day, JE is just an exam, right? And IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology, the Ivy League engineering colleges in India, they're just normal colleges, right? If you don't get into it, it's not the end of the world. And if you get into it, doesn't mean that you've conquered the world. Like, I think if you remember that, then the pressure just decreases slightly because not everybody can get into it. There are limited seats and there are, I think, millions of people applying for it. So just, the, so, you know, regardless of how much, how hard you work on it, there are, because of the competition is so fierce and, you know, and you do all of those things well. And then it's, you know, this, this, this thing gets decided on that one or two days where you give that test. So and I, it may not work out. So I think that's the only advice I can give you. The only, not even an advice, a perspective that I can give you is that I know a lot of smart people that have, did not go into IIT and doing really well with their life. Um, so yeah, not really an advice, not really something that you looked for, but maybe a perspective. And I think that's connected to the next question is what's your learning and learning from life. I know that sounds like a very generic question and nobody afforded that, but I really wanted to address that is because I think it's connected to the earlier one. I think a lot of people just think about joint interest examinations because it's related to their career. And a lot of people, you know, when they're young, you ask them this question of what do you want to become when you grow up? They talk about, I want to become a doctor, I want to become an engineer, I want to become an artist, I want to do this, I want to do that. But they only think about the career. When we are young, most of the time, we only think about when we're growing up, we think about the career. But guess what? There's, career is just one part of the equation. There are a couple of more as well. So I think the most important part of the equation is actually your health. The second one is relationships. And then third comes the career. So I think the learning for me has been that career is just one part of it. Um, health and relationships are equally important, if not more. If you don't have your health, what's the point of having a lot of money? If you don't have a great relationship, what's the point of having a lot of money? You'll be miserable. The most biggest learning, I think all of us should be cognizant of this, is that all of these are important. Right from your early ages, this, the age from where you start thinking about your career, start thinking about your health, start thinking about relationship as well. And then this puts the whole JE thing into perspective, right? And when I talk about health, I'm not just talking about physical health, I'm talking about your mental health, the stuff that you read, the kind of conversations that you have. I'm talking about your relationship with your parents, with your friends, uh, with your loved ones, all those things. I think a balance is definitely a must. So yeah, that's, I don't know, went on a rant over there. Okay, next question. Um, I have two questions. I wanna know whether you have tried to solve any of the many unsolved problems in physics and math? If so, how did it go? And the answer is no, I haven't tried it because at the end of the day, folks, I'm just a high school <laughs> physics teacher. Okay, there's a lot of advanced physics and math I don't know myself. So I don't think that I would thought about attempting to even try unsolved problems, but I'm not saying that I can't do it. I think in Khan Academy, uh, I've gotten this growth mindset where anybody can learn anything and anybody can become anything. I think that I, I truly believe in that. So the reason why I don't like to do it is because I absolutely love science communication. So I love to, instead of cracking the puzzles, I love to like already crack puzzles. I love to communicate it to other folks. When I understand it, I want other people to understand it. So that's why I haven't pursued research or anything like that. I have mostly pursued you know, how do I, how do I, how do I tell this? How do I, you know, how do I package this information in a way, in a story that actually makes light bulbs lit up in your head? So that's what I focus on. Next question. Yeah, this is like 
there are a ton of questions over here, so let's choose this quickly do a rapid fire. Can you tell us about your childhood, school, college, and what language you speak at home? Where do you live? I'm gonna talk about my language. The language I speak is called Konkani, and I stay in India in a city called Bangalore. What are your hobbies and what are your plans for the future apart from teaching at Khan Academy? Unfortunately, currently, my hobby is just teaching. <laughs> Okay, what are your education qualifications? Uh, I have done bachelors of uh, edu bachelors in, in engineering, uh, electronics and communications. Who is the person that you admire the most in your life? Well, there are multiple people, but if I had to pick a few, it's my bro. Uh, he is my mentor. He's six years elder to me. He's my mentor and uh, love him. And my wife, of course. I admire her, I love her for where she is today and all of that. How are you so good at breaking things down so easy and make everyone understand the nature, natural world fundamentally? I think I've answered that question in the beginning. All right, the next one. Which physicist do you admire the most and why? How did you came into teaching physics? Did you face the same problems? Okay, okay. So the person that I, the, the physicist that I admire the most, again, there are a few, but I think if I had to pick one, you probably know who I talk about. Feynman, <laughs> obviously. I love Richard Feynman because because if you've seen his videos, I've, I've watched all, all the videos that I could get my hands on on YouTube. He does exactly what I said in the beginning. He has the ability to, to um, use as simple words as possible, but not dumb it down, but not oversimplify it. And you know, if, 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 you don't, if, if you want to experience that, I would highly recommend watching a couple of videos of his. One is on the double-slit experiment that he spoke about, and the second one is on magnets probably link in the description. I can I can add the link in the description. Just go through it. It's just so, the way he articulates it, I fell in love with science communication, I think, after I started watching his um, videos. And then I started looking at his lectures, Feynman lectures, books, and that's how I, started, I got it reading into it. And the second question is like, you know, was I so passionate when I was in classroom? Did I you know, was I that much interested when I was in my ninth or 10th grade? When I was in school, did I also have the same passion that I have right now? Of course not. Nowhere close to it. No, not at all. When I was in school, I think it was like uh, any other subject for me. I did like it a slightly more because I found that physics was a little bit more logical than any other subject. I hated history, for example, because it just felt like remembering dates for me. Um, so I did find math and physics slightly more logical and I felt like I li liked it slightly more than my other subjects but nowhere close to like saying that, oh my God, this is so amazing. I'm gonna make a career out of like this, these subjects or teaching these subjects, nothing like that. Okay, if you had to pick a most beautiful equation, which would you pick? How about a personal favorite or a very under underrated one? Well, if I had to pick one, um, because I don't know a lot of equations, like to be, to be honest, I don't know a lot of equations, but if I had to pick one, it would be definitely Maxwell's equations. I love them. That's the reason why I also made a, started making a video series on them. Those equations are so elegant. I just like, it's so beautiful. I just, I, I look at them and I was like, oh my God. And I actually, I wanted to buy a Maxwell's t-shirt <laughs> and I didn't get one. Oh. But anyways, uh, so that's that. But if you ask me for an underrated equation, I feel like going back to F equals MA, that's a very underrated equation. And the reason for that is because first of all, that along with Newton's third law, you can solve most of mechanics. That's pretty insane. Like when I was a student, I couldn't even comprehend that because I didn't look at it this way. But now as a teacher, I realized like almost all of your mechanics can be derived with just F equals MA and action equals minus reaction. How crazy is that if you think about it? Like that's insane. That's amazing. That's amazing unification right there. So that's for F equals MA. But another reason why I find this is to be underrated is because it's not very intuitive. And this is one of the things that I, I, I found early, you know, when I was teaching kids that, um, you know, F equals MA is something that's in, it's introduced in your eighth grade or ninth grade. And so it feels like it's a common equation, not a new equation. Cool, I understand it. But the fact that force causes acceleration and not motion, that's not intuitive. Because in our daily life, in our daily world, because we are so much in the world of friction, I think our limited experiences give us, you know, has, has built an intuition which says that, hey, you know, you need to push things to make things move. And so I think the equation that we really have in our head that's intuitive in our head is equal to F, is F equals MV. We think intuitively that force causes motion. Uh, we think intuitively that if you push something harder, it will move faster. 
And therefore, subconsciously, I think we always think that F equals MV. And it's, that's the reason why sometimes, sometimes even when I say things like in, in my classroom, when I've said things like, hey, there's net force is zero, but it's moving. People have asked like, if, it's, if there is no net force, how is it moving? And when people ask that question to me, that's when I realize, oh yeah, this is not so intuitive. It's not intuitive that ex, you know, force causes acceleration. Net force is zero means acceleration is zero, not necessarily velocity is zero, because that's not what you see in your daily life. And that's why I see that, I feel like this equation is also quite, quite, quite underrated. Okay. After Feynman lectures, which books are you gonna recommend by you to read for physics and math? Best books, physics, um, for conceptual understanding. I think, I haven't actually, like, you know, in the past few years, I've only been making videos in Khan Academy for, um, for high school physics and all of that. So I didn't actually refer a lot of books. Uh, so if, but, but the ones that I really referred is, um, Resnick and Halliday, um, University of Physics by Young and Fried Friedman. And third one would be, of course, uh, if you're in India, you would probably love Hetsi Verma, Conceptual Physics. I think I love these three books. Um, of course, uh, Feynman Lectures is, Feynman Lectures actually, you know, when I started looking at Feynman Lectures, when I first started reading Feynman Lectures, I felt like they're so super advanced and it does, it does have advanced math and everything. But I think, if you keep reading that same thing over and over and over and over again, it's I think it starts making sense. So yeah, these are a few few books that I'm I could recommend. But I think now that I'm gonna make more videos on relativity and quantum, I'll start exploring and reading more. And so I'll update this list. I'll let you folks know uh, more books maybe in the future. What is your favorite sci-fi movie and why? Except Interstellar. Well, I mean. The favorite sci-fi movie is like the best, my favorite sci-fi movie is like one of the best movies ever made. Why? Because it's one of the best movies ever made. You, you, if you don't know which movie this is, then I'm not gonna tell you, okay? That's like, you should know what movie this is. <laughs> this is the movie, I'm not gonna tell you, but that's the one, right? Do you think we should be taught how to learn a subject before teaching us any subject like PCMB and other stream? I really think so. I feel that, you know, when I was in school, I think when we were all in school, what our parents and teachers tell us is to study. Study, 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 study. They don't tell us how to study. I think it's just implied. It's like, you know, you know how to study it. Like you just revise, you just look over and over again. But over the past few years, after being in Khan Academy, I understood that there is this whole branch of research, whole branch of science called learning sciences, which talks about how your brain works, how you store memories, how memories are formed, how, you know, and 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 what's and based on that, how how what is the what are some strategies that which you can learn? So I think learning sciences is important to learn. How, learning how to learn, I think, is super important. If you're interested, um, a few books that I can recommend are one is ABCs of Learning. I think it's super cool. It's both for students and teachers. So every subject has every chapter has like how can you use it for yourself. So I love that book. The second one would be a course that I would recommend, which is called Learning How to Learn. It's a free course that you can find, I think, on Coursera. It's an amazing course. It talks about your working memory, you know, cognitive load. It talks about chunking, elaboration techniques. It's so cool. And I really, really think that these strategies can help you um, learn things uh, in a more effective way. For example, I realized that revising is a waste of time. I mean, it's not as effective compared to recalling. They use something called as recalling technique. Retrieval practice, deliberate practice, spaced repetition, blah, blah, blah. There's so many strategies and all of that. And I think it's super, super important for every kid to know and experience it. And use your high school as like a testing playground. Like, you know, don't just study for the sake of examinations, but in at least in low stake examinations, what I think, what I, I would advise students to do is just like, Experiment with different learning techniques and then see which of the learning techniques work. In this way, if something doesn't work, you don't blame yourself, you blame the technique and then you adapt and you change the technique so you use failure as actually the stepping stone for success and you do all of that. I really feel learning sciences is super, 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 super important. I feel that it's not being taught a lot and I think you should, we should learn all of that. So yeah, if you're interested in it, please, please go check these things out. Your part-time job is making quality science videos in Khan Academy and on this channel I know, but from many videos, I really want to know what is your main or full-time job? My main full-time job is to make science videos in Khan Academy. <laughs>
Okay, then there are a bunch of questions about my journey into Khan Academy. Um, am I the person who taught physics in Khan Academy? How did you end up at Khan Academy? Yes, I'm the person who teaches physics in Khan Academy India channel. How did I end up at Khan Academy? That's actually, so what happened was, a f I think five to six years back, when Khan Academy came to India, they released this, uh, this, this, I think this, this competition where they asked folks to sort of like submit and explain a video. And so I did that. I submitted this video, which is still there on my channel. It's called Doppler Effect, <laughs> like never before, pure logic. It is logical. I submitted that video and after a few months, I got this email from Khan Academy. I still preserve this image because this was email because this was one of like the best time. Like I, this is one of the most wonderful moments of uh, my career when somebody from Khan Academy said, we are impressed. And that's how I got to know Anand Srinivas. If folks, folks who don't know, he used to head the Khan Academy content team back then. Now he heads his own ed tech uh, neo school. It's called, it's called Stay Curious. My wife works with him and all of it. So it's pretty cool. I, I, and they do a lot of learning strategies, growth mindset and all of that. Okay. How do you keep yourself motivated doing hard work while learning? I, NES, NES the way. I think NES is, NES stands for video game, right? Nintendo video game, right? Okay. How do you keep yourself motivated at doing hard work while learning? I think, um, I, I think this question makes a lot of sense. Like if you look at it from a student's perspective, because for a student, I think there's a lot of exam pressure, right? Like you're being judged um, um, for that. And so you're studying for, because you don't, you don't want people, you, because there's so much at stakes over here. But when I'm learning, I think there's not much at stake. I mean, there is, of course, I want to make, there is a deadline that I have to meet. I have to make X number of videos. These videos need to have high quality. But it's it's a different kind of stress. It's a different kind of, it's a healthy stress. It's a healthy pressure. What I'm trying to say is that when you come out of this exam mode and uh, when you love what you're really doing, even if it's hard, e you know, even if sometimes it's very stressful, if you have that bigger goal, like I said, my bigger goal is to make things click in other people's mind. I think just that motivates you, that, that, that bigger goal, I think that is the core thing. So I feel like you need to find an intrinsic motivation to, um, you know, you need to find, okay, why are you doing what you're doing? I mean, sure, uh, one part of it is going to be like for external gratifications, like you want money, you want recognition, you want to do all of that, you want career, you want all of that, great. But if, if that's the only answer, then you will be miserable. You need to find some intrinsic motivation, some intrinsic reason, like higher purpose for why you're doing that. If you can find that, if you can find that, I think then you're set for life. Because then, even if those things are hard, hard times and all of that, you'll be able to cope with Then okay. Are you satisfied with what you are today? Have you reached the heights and goals you thought in the childhood? In my childhood, I thought I wanted to be an astronaut, so nowhere close to the heights of that. But are you satisfied with what you are today? It's a very deep question, actually. Uh, I'll tell you, I don't really have an answer for it because I don't like to think about uh, connecting my satisfaction with where I am. I try to disconnect the two because of an important, interesting quote that I heard from Nawal Ravikant. If you don't know Nawal Ravikant, he's incredibly awesome. Um, you should listen to his podcast. Uh, podcast. He has this amazing podcast called How To, uh, he, he made an amazing tweet called uh, How To Get Rich Without Getting Lucky. It's an amazing tweet storm. Anybody, everybody should read it, regardless of whether you want to get rich or not. It's a beautiful articulation of how he thinks about money and everything else in general. So in his podcast, he said, you know, somebody asked him, somebody asked him what, what does he think humanity collectively does wrong? Like in general, like if you had to name one thing that humanity as a, we as humanity do collectively wrong, what is that one thing? And what Naval said actually blew my mind. He said, and it made sense to me, he said, um, the biggest mistake that we make is thinking that something external is gonna bring happiness to us. Something external is gonna make us happy. I think that's the biggest mistake and I totally get it. And that's the reason why today I try to disconnect my happiness from wherever I am, like regardless of where I'm in my career, regardless of where I am, like with, with respect to anything else. I, you know, so, okay, here's the thing. So earlier as you think that, hey, you know, superficial, materialistic, materialistic things don't matter. So that's fine, right? Like that's, that's, people get that. But then I also realized you shouldn't connect your happiness to other things as well. Like for example, if you don't have a lot of friends, if you become miserable, for example, right? Like if you don't have a lot of friends and you become miserable and you think, okay, gaining a lot of friends is gonna make me happy. I think that's also not true. Yes, relationships and friends are important, but you need to find 
Um, but but I think the ideology that I subscribe to now is that you know if you have like the most basic things like you know if you have a sound mind if you have if you if if you're not in crippling debt um or you know you have some some basic necessities sorted then nothing should stop you from being happy like there's nothing that is stopping you from being happy we only think that okay you know what if i get this next promotion or if i if i you know if i get this girlfriend or i don't know something else some other goal if i achieve some other goal then i'll be happy so i think that's a myth and uh I think that this question actually reminded me of that. Um, be content with what you have. Go after all of these ambitions and all of this, do that, but don't think that, oh, you know what? Unless that happens, I won't be happy or I won't be satisfied. Uh, I think that's uh, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to f I'm trying to tell myself, or I'm, I'm trying to be satisfied with whatever I have, right? That's that's basically, okay. If not Floathead Physics, what would you name your channel? I'm so glad somebody asked this question. Have you wondered why I named my channel Floated Physics? Well, the reason I did that is because I thought, I, I discovered, like, again, this is eight years ago, I discovered green screen, the magic of green screen, the idea that I could subtract the rest of my body and just have a floating head to explain things. It fascinated me so much. I thought back then that that's what I'm gonna do for my videos. I'm gonna use a floating head to explain physics and because it's so cool, because I find it so cool. I'm gonna be a millionaire, I'm gonna be rich and like, whoa. That's why I named my channel Floated Physics and I absolutely hate it. I don't like it. Because when I look at like other channels out there like Veritasium, Minute Physics, I'm like, whoa, these names are so deeply meaningful. And I look at Floated Physics, like what is that? But I never thought about changing it because I never, like I said earlier, I never thought that YouTube is not it's it, and YouTube is not going to be a big thing for me anyways, right? So um, now I don't know whether I should change it, not change it. But what would you have named the channel? What other channels? What other names that I've grappled with in the past is I thought of you know, naming myself not a not a physicist. I mean that's like sort of like a self-deprecating thing, not a physicist. Uh, also saying that you know what you don't need to be a physicist to understand these things. So sort of like like I thought like that's another thing. Del X Del P. If anybody gets that. Let me know. Del X Del P. I think that's a it's a very clever thing. Anyways, what the physics? Um, and then lastly, I thought just thought like you know I can just keep it simple and just give my name Mahesh Anwar, right? But I don't know. I don't know. I I I I don't know whether I should change my channel name now. I'm not sure. I'm not gonna think too much about it. It's fine. What is one fond memory of your childhood self doing some experiment activity? Okay, not much in childhood. I didn't, I wasn't too much into experiments, activities or anything in the child. I can't remember, but I remember in my engineering days, I had so much fun working on this project with my friends. Um, we built this uh, stone thrower, which we call the trebuchet. It's a weapon of mass destruction from the earlier ages. We had so much fun doing that. In fact, I actually have a video. I have, I remember editing and putting it all together of how we constructed that. So there's, you know, if you want to watch that video of us actually building that, I'll, I'll add the link in the description, but that's, that's one of the activities that come to my mind. Okay, one last question, and this is Neutron, by the way. <laughs> she was dying to meet me, uh, so I just let her in. So one last question, I really love this question, but it's not really, it, the question was kind of like, um, you know, can you, can you think about a topic that, like, let me just let it, we should talk about something that's really interesting and why you're interested in that, but something that's so interesting, but it doesn't look like it's interesting to begin with. I thought about it a little bit. Uh, there are a few things, but I think the one that I can easily convey in such, you know, in this kind of a video is when you look at a helium balloon, I'll tell you what fascinates me when I look at the helium balloon. We all know what I, why a helium balloon goes up, right? Because the density is lower and, you know, if things have lower density, the buoyant force is longer, is, is bigger than that. But, w so the buoyant force in the helium balloon makes it go up, it accelerates it up, right? But where does the buoyant force come from? Like, why does the buoyant force even exist? The buoyant force exists because of gravity. This means because gravity is pulling down on the helium balloon, that's the reason why it is going up. If there was no gravity to pull it down, it wouldn't have gone up. And I think there's a life lesson out there. And that's why I think I find it very, very fascinating.